Praise God. So I, I know it's Pentecost Sunday and you know I'm, I'm not the type of guy that likes to preach on a theme when it's a theme of that day. You know, other than Easter and Christmas because it's just there. Um, I, I just follow the Spirit of God. That's, that's what I do. I just follow God. Um, but today, because it's Pentecost, I'm like, okay, God, I want to just th- think on this and, and just maybe continue on. Because two weeks ago, I, I, I spoke on the baptism of the Spirit and what, the, what it looks like when the Spirit of God rests upon us and how in our weakness, His strength is made perfect. Amen? And how the power of Christ rests upon us when we are at the end of ourselves. So when we come to the end of ourselves, that is when you experience the grace of God. If you wonder, man, how come I'm not experiencing God's help in all this? Ask yourself, are you helping yourself? (laughs) Is it your strength doing something? Or is Christ helping you? And so I, I, I realized, okay, you know what? I'm going to continue on the thought of the Holy Spirit because the work of the Holy Spirit is really, really important. And it's like, but Pastor, what's the point of t- talking about him? It's because he is very, very important these days. Since the day that he ascended on, uh, on the day of Pentecost, he has never left. And as long as he's here, let's fellowship with him, amen? And he will take us to Jesus and the Father. Ain't that something? He's a comforter, he's a counselor, he's a teacher, he's our guide. And, you know, let me make the statement loud and clear. There is no other path to heaven or to God except through Jesus Christ. He is not a road map, he is the road map. He is not a door, he is the door. So there's no other way you can get to God except through Jesus Christ. I want to make that statement so clear because I've seen so many, uh, I, I've been seeing it more in these last days where, where, where there are a lot of preachers and pastors, uh, you know, that, that declare he is only a, a way or a door or a thing. And this is where I will stand up and say he is the way, the door, and there's no one else. Can I get an amen, church? That's what I believe and is right there in the Bible. And I believe what the Bible says. And so we as believers, as disciples in Christ, when someone comes to you and says, what is the pathway to God? There's only one and his name is Jesus. Not Buddha, not Allah, not anything. There's no other way. Sure, they can, the, you know, there are songs written about Jesus. Maybe, maybe it might be a seed about Jesus. But in order to get to God, he, the person has to come to Jesus first. Their personal contact with him. Amen? Amen? Amen, church. Amen. I, I think I just bursted someone's bubble here. It's okay. I don't mind. I go what the Bible says. And so based on that, I want us to turn to John chapter 3, verses 3. And we'll read from, from, from there on. Uh, and I will touch on, on the book of Acts as well. I mean, there's a lot of things, a lot of issues. The more I research, the more I see there's a lot of issues that are uh, coming to a place of compromise and, and statements. That are, and I, I don't have time to get into it. The thing is, church, you study it for yourself. You do the research. But don't do the research outside of the Bible. Always bring the Word of God in it and see what the Bible says. Amen? Not what a popular pattern. Even what I say, you take it to the Word. Is Pastor Bob saying the right thing? Well, let me search it in the Word first. Amen? Amen. So do that. You have full permission to do that, to test me on the Word of God. Because I have to stand in front of God one day and give an answer. (laughs) And and so do all of us. So here is a cool thing. Okay, it's John chapter 3, verses 3. We all know this, but I want to explain this carefully. Jesus answered him, whom? Nicodemus. Truly, and you can follow NIV there. I'm following what's uh, the version here. Uh, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see, in another version says, experience the kingdom of God. So no one can experience or see God's kingdom. And that not only means heaven, it also means heaven on earth. Hey, we're always looking forward to going to heaven, but God's deepest desire was for heaven to be experienced here on earth. 
So while we as disciples are sitting and waiting for heaven, heaven is crying out and saying, we are waiting for you. Not to come up here for us to manifest here on earth. That's why your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So a lot of things are established in heaven, but now it's time for the earth to experience what heaven is like. So then when we get to heaven, it's just like, oh, it's not a surprise. It's just like, this is exactly what we've been experiencing here on earth. So church, let's not wait, wait, wait for the day when we die. Death will come God knows when. Like Andrew said, we don't know what will happen. Question is, is heaven being experienced here on earth? And so the only way to see and experience God's kingdom is by being born again. Now, now look at this. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? All right, this is cool. Okay, he's, now he's trying to think. He's, he's trying to reason. Okay, this is, this is crazy what you're saying, Jesus. Jesus provoked a lot of things that was outside of a cultural mindset. Now look at verse 5. It says, that Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man is born of water, there, there it is, Un unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So now he says born again, and then it says water and Spirit. A lot of teaching that says, you know, born of water might mean baptism, water baptism. You know, I, I believe that's part of it. But there's two things that I believe. Women, mothers, how many of you know, when you're pregnant and you're ready to give birth, what's the first sign? Water breaks. So <laughs> that's the first sign that's like, uh-oh, the baby's coming. So number one, Jesus was saying, the person has to be physically born here. All right? Why? Because you're born in your mother's womb. All right? So in other words, okay, let me finish this. Number one, a person born of water in the mother's womb. So if you're a human being, this is for you. <laughs> Unless you are born of water, a human being, and born of the Spirit, being born again, being spiritually renewed, having a recreated uh, uh, spirit inside of you, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, that's number one. The second part of being born of water is in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 onwards. So let me make a statement here in terms of born of water. If it is, because there are some, let me tell you, there are some teachers that believe that even the devil will make it to heaven. That is absolutely false. If, if there is an unfamiliar spirit that you believe that, you know, maybe it's attached to your grandpa or whatever, it's nonsense. They will not be saved. That's a spirit. Any spirit that is not the Holy Spirit will not make it to heaven. I'm telling you this right now. I'm hearing ungodly statements made right from the pulpit. And so I want to make it clear from the word of God. Jesus is saying, you as a human being, when you get saved, you can enter into God's kingdom. The devil cannot. You will start hearing statements that way. You know then what the Bible says. If it is a spirit, a spirit has no access into God's throne. Okay? Now hang in there. You'll see what I mean. Now, uh, Ezekiel chapter 36. Now this is the second part. I believe what it means to be born of water. I will sprinkle clean water on you. All right? So he's saying, you look dirty now, but let me clean you up. And you will be, say this out loud, what? You will be, wow, thank you, sister. You will be clean. Man, I tell you, if you receive Christ into your life, you are clean. But pastor, why do I feel so dirty? It's because it's, free, it's a feeling. It's not who you are. When Jesus said, when God said, I will sprinkle clean water on you, you are clean once and for all. All right? So number one, yes, you have to be born on this earth. Uh, only a human being, being born of the Spirit, can enter into heaven. Secondly, you have to be cleansed by the only water that God provides, the cleansing flow of the Spirit. When He cleanses you, you are clean once and for all. So in God's eyes, you are already clean. Even if yesterday you drank alcohol, got, got drunk, and said, God, what am I doing? You've just acted something outside of your identity. That's all. And what you do is that you renew your mind and say, God, 
I thank you for redeeming me that that is not who I am. I turn back and align myself to you. I am a child of God. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am forgiven. I am clean. I am blessed. Man, even when you're struggling with cigarettes, while you're smoking, start confessing who you are in Christ. That thing will leave you in no time. Some can go cold turkey. I've heard some story this morning saying, oh yeah, I went cold turkey. I'm like, man, that's good for you. But some of us who are struggling, start saying, you know what, God? This does not define me. The blood of Jesus defines me. Keep confessing that. And man, let me hear testimonies. Let us hear testimonies of how you were set free. Not by saying, I promise I will not do this again. Five minutes later. <laughs> right? How many of you have made promises only five minutes later you broke them right there? Or when you promised your wife, honey, I promise you things will be different from now onwards and five minutes later you're ready to cuss at her. Hey, don't look at me like I'm the devil. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. There's sometimes fire within the house. <laughs> and the only way to, to extinguish that fire is by love. Amen. And so, <laughs> and so even making promises to yourself will not fix it. It is you turning to Jesus. That's why I will trust you till I die. Until I die, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to put my faith in you. Begin to confess who you are in Christ and watch how the truth will set you free. Truth is not out there with, with Dalai Lama and Buddha and all. Truth is right here. You don't read the word to know about God. You read the word to know Him. Yeah. And when you read the word to know Him, you get to know who you are as well. Ain't that awesome? Ain't that awesome, church? Now look at this. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. And I will cleanse you from all the impurities and from all your idols. That does not just simply mean graven image. Any kind of idol that you've got in your life. It can even be your spouse. Some of us believe that, oh, if it wasn't for my spouse, I would not come to church. I will not be saved. False. Your spouse didn't save you. Christ saved you. Do you hear me, church? Your uncle didn't save you. God saved you. Your auntie didn't save you. God saved you. I'm going back to the basics. Because this is, the, do you realize the attack on the truth is right on the foundation? You can talk about healing. You can talk about deliverance. You can talk about this. You can talk about that. That's not what the devil is worried about. If he can attack the foundation and make you to believe something else outside of God, you've just fallen down. Hey, you've just fallen down. So keep going, keep going. From all your idols, I will give you, say this out loud, a new heart and put in... I'll give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit inside of you, church. That was the heart, that's in the Old Testament, that was the heart of God from the beginning. I was like, man, I, I get, I, I, please excuse me as I share this. Sometimes I get angry when people worship the, the building and says, we're coming to church. I say, you are the church. Amen. Bible says, your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if you're gathering together with another brother or sister for coffee, you're having church there as well. You know how many people I meet, no, not here, but <laughs> they come to my office and talk about the building and this structure and I said, stop it. You can meet in your own house and you can have the Holy Ghost invasion there. Why? Because it is two or three gathered together in my name. You don't need a church building to be called a church. Just come together and talk about Jesus. You are a church. And you become a church when Jesus lives inside of you. And he's put a new heart and a new spirit inside of you. Please excuse me. I'm reiterating a lot of things here. I, I, I understand the meaning of the song, creating me a clean heart. I understand that. I understand why. But in the Old Testament, they didn't have salvation. They didn't get it. They were looking forward to it. They knew that the Messiah was coming. They knew that. And even in, in the book of Ezekiel, in the Old Testament, God saying, this is my desire for you. And so to sing, create in me a clean heart, oh God, means no sense to God because he said, I've already given you a new heart. 
Thank you. One amen. <laughs> Do you hear me, church? Because then when you're confessing, oh, Lord, create in me a clean heart, then what's going on in the back of your mind? I don't have a clean heart. I don't have a clean heart. I don't have a clean heart. I need God to create. Lord, please create in me. Then you stumble and fall. Say, Lord, what happened to the clean heart? Right? Sometimes we pray the very opposite of who we already are, what God has already given us. And renew a right spirit with me. God has already said, I'm giving you a new spirit. That's why when you read the Old Testament, you've got to read the Old Testament in the light of the new. Through the glasses of what Christ has accomplished. I was, I was talking to someone the other day. Man, God, you know, the Bible says you're going to work by the sweat of our brow. I said that was the curse. But when Jesus came, the curse has been broken. And so therefore the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. In other words, he's saying, just trust me. Amen. Amen. So God is not calling us to labor, 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 labor and then just sweat and then die of stress. I, I shared this analogy before where two birds sat on top of a tree looking at uh, all the Christians like just, just in a worry and, and huddling and then, oh my God, what do I do? And one bird said to the other bird, said, they don't know the creator that we know. Because even, even Jesus said, the birds of the air are not even worried about how are they going to be fed. And the Heavenly Father makes sure that they provide how much more God will make sure that you are provided for. I want you all to come to a place of, ah, <laughs> of rest. And it starts in your relationship with God. I will remove from you a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, a soft heart. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you have a soft heart. You're not a softy. <laughs> That's not what it means. It doesn't mean, yeah, you look at you, you're a softy. People are just going to walk all over. No, no, no. It means a heart that's receptive to God. Because unless your heart is, is softened to Him, you cannot receive what He's giving you. You can't. A heart of stone cannot receive. I'm sorry, you can't. But when God says, I will give you a heart of flesh. Do I have one more verse after that? There. And I will put my spirit in you. And what? Move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep all my laws. Well, Pastor, what about the Ten Commands? This is where the Spirit of God says, He says, the Spirit will move you to keep my laws. Wow. You don't have to try to be a good person. You are already good. Isn't that awesome? You don't have to try, well, I want to be a good boy today or a good person girl today and then we get up trying to evaluate well God am I going to be good oh my goodness I'm going to face that guy again I'm going to talk to that woman again I'm ready to bite the head off just say Lord I thank you that you created me good you created me as your child you've already given goodness and mercy. it's already inside my heart God I thank you and then move on just keep walking why because now your mind is being renewed all right and be careful to keep my laws. Now let's go back to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Brother, do you know repentance means the renewing of your mind? It means to reconsider. So as you listen to the message, reconsider. And when you're reconsidering, you're already repenting. In the Old Testament, yes, repentance was remorseful, you feel sorry, and yes, there's nothing wrong with being sorry, but how many felt sorry for something and still did it again? To repent means to have a transformative change, like a complete change inside of you and in your mind. It says a change of heart and mind. Both is transformative, and that's what repentance means. And you do it, again, by meditating on His Word. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no, no one can see. Okay, go, uh, go to verse 6. Okay, we, we read born of water and the spirit. Okay, so you, you don't read things out of context. You read it together. So flesh gives birth to what? This is where I believe the born of water comes from, where Jesus is trying to say, hey, look, flesh gives birth to flesh. So, but the spirit gives birth to what? Okay. 
I won't, I won't repeat what I'm trying to explain again. So verse 7, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Next verse. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. How if you know in Acts chapter 2, we, we, we read about the sound of the Spirit. Right? Like a mighty rushing wind. We don't know where the wind is. You can go and do that and know where the wind is going. But here Jesus is saying, the Spirit is that way. You hear the sound, but you do not know where it's coming from. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the what? No one can put a finger on that and say, Aha, I know where you came from. I know where you're going. You are born of the Spirit. There's only one place you come from. From where? Heaven. 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 So the Spirit of God gives you this, the, 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 the witness that you are a son of God. So just as, you know, it's like people saying, well, I think I know where the Spirit is go going. Do you know where the wind is going? Nope. That doesn't mean erratic behavior. I know people that have taken things and be like, well, I feel the Spirit moving, so I just got to do this. No, it, it means none of that. It doesn't mean any of that. It just means you cannot put a period on the Spirit and say, aha, I think I figured you out. Same thing with someone who's born of the Spirit. They can't look at you and say, well, you belong to this person and that person. They have to look at you and say, wait a second, you are born of the Spirit. Born of the Spirit, amen? Born of the Spirit. So when people look at you, are they looking at the Spirit? Or are they looking at you, oh yeah, you were born 20 years ago to so-and-so mother and father and you have a job right now. Everyone has a job. Well, not everyone, but some, Right? But when they look at you, they say, wait a second, they don't belong here. They belong to heaven. Amen. All right? All right. Nicodemus said to him, how can this be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, but you do not know these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Verse 12. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Verse 13. No one has ascended to heaven except he who descended from heaven, even the Son of Man who is in heaven. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Okay, verse 16. For God... So love the world. Okay, I used to read it as God loved the world so much. But when I saw the exact Greek meaning of the word so, it means for God loved the world this way. That's what it means. In other words, God is revealing his love. Because people have again taken, well, if God so loved me, why can't he accept my lifestyle? False. There's a huge thing about love and unity. Well, it's all about love and unity. Then everything comes together. And then it just gets blended. And then things get compromised. The truth gets compromised. But Jesus said, hey, I, I lost my train of thought there. I, which means I, I got to keep going. For God so loved the world. In other words, for God loved the world this way. That he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now look at this. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be... Wow! So who else can save you? Jesus. The world only can be saved through Jesus Christ. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned all already. So condemnation is already there for those who do not believe in him. So church, guess what? We don't have to walk in condemnation. Bible says in, in, uh, in the book of John, it says where the devil is condemned. The spirit, number one, the spirit of God is here to convict the world of sin convict the disciples of righteousness and then convict the devil that he's already condemned. So when you feel condemned, you say, you know what, devil? You are condemned. I am a righteousness of God. You are going to hell. I'm going to heaven. 
I have a relationship with God. You don't. See you later. Because condemnation is, is never meant to be in us. Never. Sin, guilt, shame, and condemnation is never meant to be in our hearts. If you ask someone when they're trying to fix, let's say, an addiction, you know what is it they're trying to fix primarily? is condemnation inside. So you could try and get rid of drugs, alcohol, whatever. You could try, but underneath, do they know that they're a son of God, a daughter of God? Do they know that they're a child of God? Because all of these things, I don't know, pornography, whatever it is, it is simply to cover up what is lacking here. If the Lord is not your shepherd, you are lacking. It's true. So when we sing, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. In other words, no human being should fill your lack, even your own spouse. You don't wake up in the morning saying, well, I wonder how my honey is going to feed me, clothe me, look after me, do this. My wife is sitting back there. But you know what I mean? <laughs> You're not getting up hoping that your spouse is going to fill your need or your friend or your neighbor. You know, we, <laughs> I hear this so much. People go to different churches and be like, oh, no one sh uh, shook my hand the moment I walked in. I'm just not going to come back to that church. That could have been an off day for that church. Who knows? But again, it goes back to what? I didn't get a handshake. <gasps> God must not be in this place. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? There's always a sense of need, need, want, want, lack, lack. And when someone doesn't give to you, you then we label them, that's not the church. Why don't we come to church to seek Him, to love Him, to, to bless one another, to commune with one another? Amen. I'm not saying you shouldn't go out and shake hands, but man, if, if one day... It's missed, like I remember one day, I, I completely forgot to welcome the new visitors. Just, just, I mean, it was, just slipped my mind. Someone came to me and said, Pastor, remember, even there's a visitor here, I'm not saying this because I'm a visitor, but I'm like, well, that's exactly, you just, that's a dead giveaway. Yes. <laughs> Make sure you, in, you invite so they can feel welcome. I said, I'm sorry. I just, it just slipped my mind. You know, when our need is met in Him, there is no demand put on any human being. Do you hear what I'm saying? Are you putting a demand on your spouse that is unnecessary? A demand on your neighbor, a demand on the church, a demand on the pastor, a demand on the deacons that is not even necessary. I've said this before, the world is in need of love, but we as His disciples, we become love. We embody love. We don't look around looking for love. We, man, we already love because God is love. And because God lives inside of us, we become love. Do you hear what I'm saying, church? Man, more than Pentecostalism, whatever this, I just want us to get our identity in Him. Our needs met in Him. Amen? Just watch. You do that, all these things will just fade away. All these little petty issues. The music is not right. This is not right. Everything will just disappear in the light of His glory and grace. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And then look at this. This is the verdict. That light has come into the world. Verse 19. That light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of what? Because they're what? Their deeds were evil. So when your deed is evil, your love is for what? Darkness. There you go. Your love is for darkness. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Isn't that crazy? I wonder why sometimes people don't come to the light because of the fear of being exposed. But I said this, when we are transparent, there's no fear in love. Love covers a multitude of sin. Ain't that awesome, church? 
So if love can draw people in, imagine people turning away from darkness to light. Imagine that. But he who does the truth comes to the light that it may be revealed that his deeds have been done in. Here's the question, church. I'm talking to disciples. I'm, I, I don't even have time to go to the book of Acts. That's okay. I'll reserve it maybe for next week. I, I, and I'm speaking this from a burden as a pastor and even as a child of God, even as a disciple. Where do you draw the line these days? Where do you draw the line as his disciples? How do you draw the line in your life where the light of God is so evident? Is so evident. People are already walking in darkness, but when they look at you, they're like, man, you're shining. You're glowing. What is the answer? Huh? Sorry, I can hear. That, that's cool. I, I love it. <laughs> I'm not asking. It's a rhetorical question. <laughs> but thank you for your, for, your, for your honesty. I love it. It's a rhetorical question. You know, I was talking to Paul. I, I love Paul. He's, 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 he's got a very strong perspective into the future. Very strong. I, I said, man, you've, you've got some perspectives that, that need to be heard, that really need to be heard. And he's saying, Bob... Like, do we even, are we even aware of where the world is coming to? And he said, he said, it's like, you don't have to wait for it to be at the door. It's already at the door. The only difference, it hasn't come through Shiloh door yet. I think that's a very, very good thought. It's already here. The government is changing rules, changing regulations, making things so, it, 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 the only difference right now, guys, it hasn't come through our doors yet. So when that time comes, are we going to turn to the word to draw the line? Or is our life filled with compromise, saying, well, whatever you feel like it, God is love. Many people have made that statement. Well, God is love. He should accept me the way I am. Yes, come to him the way you are and let him transform you to who he is. It's a different sort of sermon, I know. But when that day comes, church, when that day comes, where even your pastors won't be allowed to preach a certain way, And be given a choice, well, marry this way or not. What is the church going to do? I'm here to equip you, to build you up, so that you can stand, not saying, well, I'll talk to the pastor, let me call the pastor. The pastor knows the Bible really well. There are days I was wrong when I read the scripture again. I was wrong about my own theology, and I said, Lord, I repent. Lord, I repent. But the day will come when we will have to stand together as a church and say, Lord, you know what? My life is all yours. I am drawing the line. No compromise. I'm standing on the word of God. Amen? That's why we sang the song, On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other grounds is sinking sand. He is a solid rock. Amen. Let's stand. Let's stand. Lord, I thank you that you are the solid rock. That you are the center. Everything revolves around you. That it is you. Lord, that we can sing and say, you know what, God? From the beginning till the end, it's all about you, Jesus. It is all about you, Jesus. Father, if there's anyone here that it's not sure of their relationship with you. I pray right now, let them know that they can approach the throne of God in boldness and say, God, 
forgive me. I'm a sinner. I need your grace. I receive Jesus into my life. I accept you, Lord. I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord, as the only way to God. As the only way to God. Lord, even as I pray, pray that prayer, Holy Spirit, just breathe on them right now. Rest upon them. Let them feel and experience God. If they haven't felt what it's like, Lord, let them feel it right now, the love of the Father. Let them know how much God loves them. Father, forgive us because we turned our attention and our desire to temporary things. Things that are sinking sand. Lord, and some of us have already been sinking in them. But I thank you for the promise of your word. He pulled me out of, my, out of the miry clay, set my feet on the rock to stay, put a new song in my mouth. Lord, you gave us a new heart, a new spirit. You gave us your Holy Spirit and you call us new. You call us clean. You call us sons and daughters. You call us my child. My child. Father, what I ask is just one thing, Lord. When we walk out of this place, we walk out confident, knowing that we have this relationship, this precious relationship with our Heavenly Father. That you are God who does not sleep or slumber. Even at two in the morning, God, when we are wide awake, you're there listening. Say, hey, talk to me. Talk to me. May we walk in this confidence, Lord, this boldness. That God has not deserted us or pulled us aside. He's been with us right to the end. But today, God, we make a choice, even as a church, we make a choice to walk with Jesus. To walk with Jesus. To go where He's going. If He says run, we will just run with Him. If He says stop, we will just stop with Him. If He says just sleep, just lie down for a second, Lord, we will sleep and lie down even for a second with Him. Father, you didn't call us to live stressed, broken, and just losing our minds. No, God, you called us to a place of rest, to rest in Christ, to rest in Him. He is our Sabbath. And so I give you praise, Father, today, when we walk out, we're saying, God, you are my rest. You are my Sabbath. You are my strength. And Lord, I know that some of us are going to come to a place where it's the end of the rope. That's it. It's like, Lord, that's it. We are at the end of ourselves. It's a good thing. I pray that, Lord, for those that are feeling that right now, they let them know that your eye is on the sparrow. And it is he who is watching over them. And it is He who will give them strength to overcome. Father, we thank You, we praise You, and we love You. And the things of will grow strangely dim. The light of His glory and grace Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in His wonderful the light of His glory and grace. And in the light of His glory and grace. Amen. Everyone look
look at me for one one second. I just want to let you know that God loves you so much. He loves you. And whom the Father loves, He disciplines. It's a fatherly love. And when you see that God is turning you, and you feel like you've lost something, and man, you just everything is going hectic. Sometimes God brings you to a place of frustration so that you can let go of what is frustrating you already. That's the thing. That's the thing. He's letting that happen because frustration, you, whatever it is that's causing you frustration, He's saying, "Let it go. Just let it go. Just let it go." And a father who loves his children will always come and correct, direct change discipline so hear me out church the father loves you the father loves you go in god's love god bless you amen